Let's see what's under the hood of today's guest. Like I mentioned, I go back to our two pillars, right, is education and connections. So we try really hard to have relevant content. We try not to sell like speaking spots. Um, we try hard to make it about the attendees and not, you know, giving sponsors too much and letting sponsors take over the conference. Welcome to Under the Hood of Developer Marketing, the podcast devoted to developer marketing, relations, evangelism, and advocacy. I'm Stathis Jorakopoulos, and I'm your host. In each episode, I welcome a guest from the developer marketing world. We talk about best practices, challenges, lessons learned, and share insights, data, and experiences to help you boost your devil game, talk to, and engage with developers. This podcast is brought to you by Slash Data, the leading analyst of the developer economy, and devrelex.com, a hub devoted to providing resources for developer marketing professionals, including developer ecosystem trends, news and job openings, webinars, a book, and a bi-weekly digest you can subscribe to. Access them all at devrelex.com. Hello, and welcome to a new episode of Under the Hood of Developer Marketing, Season 3. One of the things I have missed most over the past year is events, from multiple track events to meetups and even music concerts. I'm sure you've guessed today's theme, which is, of course, events. Uh, Thankfully, the Future Developer Summit returns in 2021 with four events. This year's theme is DevRel the next day. The first episode is on March 10, focusing on how to move from everyday tactics to strategic thinking and long-term mindset. You can get your free community pass or a thought leader pass for the fullest experience at futuredeveloper.io. Now, let's welcome our guest, Jana Boruta, who is a community builder and experiential marketer at Hasicorp. Jana, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. So let, let's get to know you first. Uh, as a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? I love that question. I, uh, you sent me these questions a couple of days ago. You know, I didn't know what I wanted to be. And I wish I, I wish the education system was set up in a way that like, hey, if you choose this perf- like this major or this type of thing to study, these are the different opportunities available for you. And I think for me, I always knew that I was good at some things, right? I always I was always extroverted. I loved people. I was always really organized, really good at logistics. And so based on those skill sets, I I got really lucky and I ended up in this like community building space and also doing events. Yeah, it turns out that all you took all these skills you were good at and, you know, found the perfect place that matches and actually needs all of them. So, yeah, (laughs) yeah, this is great. Uh, You mentioned the education system. I cannot go uh, into that topic, you know, because uh, one (laughs) podcast episode is not enough. No, no. <laughs> In this episode, we'll be talking about events. And speaking of which, what was the last event you actually went to, you know, physically? Was it a live music show? Was it a concert? Was What was it? It was wild. So uh, my team had organized our, like the HashiCorp Employee Summit. And it was, we brought 900 employees. We were 900 employees last February. We flew everyone together to the States and we were together for four or five days and literally the next week is when, you know, our company was like no more travel and, and, and COVID started to spread in the United States. So it, it was just wild. The, the last time I was at a, a big event was like, you know, I brought all of our employees together, which was beautiful, but also sad. <laughs> it is sad. And, uh, you know, when I was, you know, preparing the questions for our interview, I was thinking, okay, I'm asking Diana this question, but what about me? What was the last event, actual event to? And it was in July 2019. You know, the, oh, wow. the actual, yeah, because I, I do love concerts and um, this was the last one I, I went. It was The Cure. So it started off, okay, let's go. These guys are kind of old, but, you know, I love their songs. I've always done. So let's see what they're doing live and turned out, you know, to be an amazing experience, you know enough to hold me at least for a year and a half because no one did expect that so yeah yeah when you when you think about it it's really sad but let's be hopeful for the future we'll be talking more about events in a bit but tell us a bit more about yourself first you know how how did you end up in your uh, current role what has been uh, the journey from you know yana small girl organized extrovert uh, <laughs> all the way to hasicorp 
Yeah, it was interesting. So I, I graduated college in 2008, you know, during like the worst part of like the recession in the United States. And I, I was living in Colorado at the time. And, and it, it was just hard, right? I, I was like, you know, and I, I graduated college, I had college debt, like everyone else had studied marketing and finance. And I'm like, what do I do with this? Right? Where, you know, and I tried to apply for jobs and various jobs. I was like, do I go to law school? Um, but then I ended up coming home. Uh, I grew up in Berkeley, California, and I ended up getting my first, luckily my first job for a technology company. It was called Jivox. I think it's still around. And I was just doing customer support. So I, I think to back to a couple of my first jobs and they're really like, you know, I was doing customer support and then I was doing inside sales, but at least I, I got my, my footing into technology, into the startup space. I got really lucky. I got to work at a company called Engine Yard. I don't know if you remember them or ever heard of them. I heard the name. Yeah. But uh, this is as far as I can recall right now. <laughs> yeah. Is, but I know uh, the name. Okay. So Engineer is amazing. And I, this is, was actually my first exposure early days to like community building. So Engine Yard was a Ruby on Rails hosting company. And they're no longer around. Their competitor was Heroku and Heroku made a bunch of really smart like product decisions and, and Heroku is still around, got acquired by Salesforce, all of that stuff. But it was around that time that like GitHub launched and New Relic launched and Heroku launched, right? So I kind of, I got exposure into the early days of those companies, watching those companies build community. And then a lot of them were hosted on Engine Yard back in the day. So like GitHub was hosted, New Relic was hosted, a, a lot of like the early Ruby on uh, Rails, like companies, you know, the back end uh, companies were hosted on Engine Yard. So I got exposed to those type of com companies. And then Engine Yard just did a really beautiful job building community. We, we sponsored bunch of meetups and conferences every year. We sponsored people to work on open source projects. We hired open source contributors. Actually, when I worked at Engine Yard, uh, we sponsored Mitchell Hashimoto back in the day, founder of HashiCorp now, to work on Vagrant for three months, right? So it's, again, I got exposure to these different ways of building community and building goodwill in the community. And then through that job, I then eventually was like, oh, I really love community management. I love events. And then that's how I ended up here. Yeah. And uh, even though it turned out, you know, the, you came out of college at the worst time possible, I guess, <laughs> for our generation, you ended up, you know, your professional career uh, at the right time, you know, at the right place to be exposed to all this, you know, when they start, when everything started, you know, before everything grew so big and um, industry leading. Yeah. And I actually, I, I mentor a lot of like women that are just getting into tech and, you know, everyone sees me now, right? They're like, wow, Yana, you have this amazing job, right? I work at HashiCorp, right? One of like the most well-known, respected uh, companies out there building open source tools used by millions. And we have a big community, all that stuff. But I'm like, you know, and my job lets me travel all, all over the world before, you know, COVID hit. And I'm like, I worked, like, I wasn't a top student. I didn't have the best grades, but I, I, there was two things. One, I worked really hard, right? Like, and I had my first couple of jobs were like, like pretty terrible, right? Doing inside sales where I had to cold call, you know, I ended up like cold calling some of my, like my friends <laughs> of friends, right? And it was a bit embarrassing in some ways or, or customer support, right? Having to help customers, you know, figure out how to use a product. So it's like, I didn't have the, the, sexiest jobs or the easiest jobs, but eventually, right. I was like, I, I built a network and, and I, I developed certain skills that then helped me get to the job that I'm at currently. Yeah, this is great. It's been a, a great journey. I'm sure hard work had a, you know, heavy role to play there. And uh, before we, we start, you know, getting deeper into events, let's talk data. Can you please pick a mm. graph from devrelex.com slash trends and tell us what stands out for you? I cannot believe I missed this. I, the, when you sent this to me a couple of days ago, and I, I'm, I apologize that I missed this, I, I, I advise a couple of different startups helping them build their community pr programs. And I sent this to all of them. I was like, there's so much great, I don't even know which graph to, or which data point to start with. I think that the one that stood out to me was documentation tutorials. So the, the different like community engagement programs that like rank highest on the list and uh, that it says documentation and tutorials as some of the top. Uh, I was like, this just validates everything I've been saying for years, right? Like 
when developers go to learn about a new product, they, they don't want to attend a demo or they don't want to be on a sales call. They want to read your documentation, you know, go through your learn site, learn some tutorials or maybe a how-to video. So this just kind of validated like my approach and thinking to community building. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you've been uh, following the podcast, but you know, when we talk about, uh, we had a couple of talks with, for example, Luke Gilpatrick and, um, mm. you know, even uh, Jeff Sanquist, you know, where, what would your priority be in building your developer program? Documentation is always, you know, number one, it's where you, you start from. And, um, you know, this is the industry feeling and this is what we've been getting for, uh, you know, from uh, talking with people in the industry, but it's, even more powerful, you know, when you, you see it, because these are uh, data that come from our developer survey, developer economics. <laughs> so this is data that comes directly from developers. This is what they really want. We've got to listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk events. Um, get What is it that you love most about events? I'm like thinking, so from there's like the, the organizer perspective and then also attending events. So I mean, I just, I, I really love people. I love interacting with people. I love connecting with people. And I think that has been the hardest thing for me that's been missing last year, right? Is, uh, is going to conferences and, and seeing people that like I've, you know, talked to on Twitter for years or, or meeting up with people that have, you know, come to our conferences every year. So I really miss the engaging piece. And then for me, I love organizing events because, you know, an event, like a large scale, like, um, you know, some of our conferences would be a couple thousand people. You spend a year designing and building a conference, right? So the, the millions of moving pieces, right? Watching that come together and then watching people experience the event. It, it's, it's my favorite thing, right? I always stand at the registration desk when the event starts and we spend so much time kind of designing the experience from when someone walks into the 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 conference venue to the the, the coffee being really easily accessible to have really good spelling food to the lights and the music right we we spend so much time designing the experience that i love watching people uh, experience it yeah it's a great feeling I, i've worked with events in the past and you know it is exactly what you said you spend so much time designing things and preparing things and you know stressing out that everything's gonna go okay something gonna go wrong but then you know at the actual event uh when you see people enjoying i think it's one of the most fulfilling you know things for uh, especially event planners oh i completely agree yeah so uh, this is the you know the good part you know the things we love so <laughs> what is the, the biggest challenge in organizing a developer event so i think for us at HashiCorp we've always tried really hard to have just really relevant, great content, right? Because we have found that developers come for, for two main reasons, right? It's for the education piece, right? For, for great content and then for the connections. And so for us, right, it, it's making sure that we have really great technical content, like sourcing the right speakers and also making sure that we have a diverse set of speakers. I think that's you know, as a woman in tech, right, I've, I've been the only woman at different startups, things like that, right? So diversity and having representation is really important. And and I, th I find that to be really hard. And it's, such, and it's such a bummer that it is. Yeah, diversity is definitely, um, I'd say it should be a priority. You're a woman in tech, you better understand, you know, and have the actual feeling of it. But uh, especially in this podcast, we've, this is something we've discussed a lot of, a lot of times in the past with uh, many of our guests and, you know, there's only good things that can come out of diversity. So especially yeah, for, and, for content. And some yeah. of the programs, so some of the things we're trying to do at HashiCorp uh, to help improve that is, you know, HashiConf, we need a bit more experienced speakers, but we have other, like we have user groups and we have a program called HashiTalks. So, so we spend a lot of time just training a little bit like more junior speakers. So providing like, like uh, last week we hosted um, a session on like, hey, learn how to give engaging presentations, right? So we hired someone to teach people. So, so we're tr trying to provide other avenues to help people that don't have as much experience speak, right? To then become, you know, be able to be on the caliber to speak at a HashiConf. 
Yeah, this is great because, you know, public speaking is uh, among the greatest fears for many people. And when I say we, I mean, you know, people that uh, actually attend end up missing uh, some great content, some great insights from great people because they have stage fright. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been great. It's it's stage fright. It's stage fright. And also just, you know, just haven't had the opportunity to speak as well, right? Because on our call for proposals, we're like, hey, can you share or let us know like past conferences you've spoken at or where they can be like, oh, I've spoken at um, a HashiCorp user group or I've spoken at your HashiTalks a few times, right? So getting that experience and that uh, is super helpful. Yeah, yeah, definitely super helpful. So why do you think developer-focused events are important to have? Yeah, <laughs> I'm not... Why, why do we spend the money, right? Why do we have whole teams dedicated <laughs> to it? I mean, if you think of like your community program as a whole, right, you have these different initiatives and, and one of them should always be attending or organizing developer events, right? Because at, at these events, they're, I mean, they're definitely high cost, right? And, and they take a lot of work, but the relationships that you build are super invaluable. You know, people's ability your community's ability to connect with each other, right? Whether it's to build friendships, to potentially also talk about your product as well, to learn from each other, and to also be able to like meet your engineers, to to meet your founders, right? It, it's just events are part of like building community, right? And building long lasting community. I mean, we've, we've been doing our own events at, at HashiCorp since 2015. And it's just really like, you know, our first conference was 350 people, and a, a question we ask, we're like, how many hashi comps have you attended? And there's some people that have that are like, we've been to 80% of them, right? It's, it's really beautiful to see. And, and you start to come to these events and, and, and people are like, have built friendships over the years and, and we've gotten to know them as well, right? And these, these people have now become employees or core contributors or ambassadors, right? So there's just so many benefits of these in-person interactions. Yeah, definitely. And it's great, you know, to see people coming back um, again and again. And you can also see how they grow, you know, even maybe through the help of the event or, you know, the event is a great chance for you to see what they've been up to. And yeah, it's it's definitely a great thing. Exactly. Yeah. So when when are you designing and uh, preparing for an event? Um, How do you set your goals and priorities? What are they? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, so for us, right, we've never been like a leads driven company per se, right? For what I've always appreciated about the Mitchell and Armand, our founders, is community building is like the foundation for like how, how we grow, right? How we grow, you know, our open source community, things like that, how we grow our user base. Um, so, I never, you know, when I would do an event, I never had to be like, hey, we spent eighty thousand uh, dollars on this event and here was our ROI, right? Because we understand that building these event programs has a lasting thing, right? For example, we had someone speak at HashiConf 2015 um, that ended up becoming two years later a multi-million dollar customer, right? So how do I go back to HashiConf 2015 and attribute that ROI um, to that? So kind of our goals and priorities for our events, right, is really community building, it's interactions, it, it's making sure that that people have a great experience, right, that people really understand who HashiCorp is, what our values are, what our brand is. So, it, so that's how we design our experiences based on those. Yeah, you know, setting the experience for me is uh, one of the best things as setting the experience as a priority. And this is something that most of the times you cannot measure, like the example you just gave. <laughs> Yeah. The, the brand, right. It's like the brand building. You can't measure that. Or that's why I think community building is a bit challenging in some ways to measure. Cause it's like, how do you measure goodwill or people's satisfaction or uh, yeah, I think it's, it's tough, right? I think you just have to like believe that, that these work in a way or, 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 or understand the value of community without like directly like, hey, we got this many leads or this was our ROI on this like one meetup or one event that we did. Yeah, but it also, you know, helps you know, where is something, where the, when there is an event that, you know, happens maybe yearly or, you know, on specific intervals where you can see firsthand how 
you know, people uh, keep coming back and how they <laughs> may turn up, you know, from just a regular uh, attendee, let's say that I came to see what, what content you guys can share, you know, to being more engaged and in a, you know, customer level at some point. Yeah. I mean, I, I can just the amount of people, you know, that have spoken or attended, right. That are now core contributors or ambassadors or full-time employee. Like it, it's really cool to like see that cycle. And again, I've been at Hashu Corp for six years. So it, it's just really beautiful to watch like the, the foundations that we built in the early days, like they're working right. <laughs> and they're, and they're paying off, but it, it's been a multi-year overall initiative to get here. And uh, you mentioned before, you know, the the importance of, of community and, and community comes, you know, with people uh, interacting with each other, especially under a common goal. So how do you encourage interaction within your events? The reason I, I, I'm, I refer to myself as an experiential marketer, because I, I think um, it takes more to organize an event than have a table with food and some chairs and a stage and, and throw a big party, right? It's, we're very purposeful in how we create the experiences for our community, right? That, that was in person and now through our, our, di- our digital conferences. But again, the way we design uh, and, and, and think of like a user flow through a, a venue, right? Because one of our, so if we go back, so it's like education and community connections, right? Those are our two pillars is how we design these experiences, why people come to our conference. So that's how we design the experience. So for the second someone walks in, right, we create different areas that allow for community connections, right? We have a really comfortable hallway track that people can like sit on comfortable chairs, watch speakers, uh, sign up to speak. We, we do something called what's called the Hashi Cafe, right? So we always have really good coffee at our, at our conferences, right? So people can go get a cappuccino and then we have like really nice like cafe and lounge seating that I, I kind of modeled it. I think of like 1920s Paris cafes, right? Where you had like artists and, 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 and writers kind of just sitting, smoking cigars, drinking coffee or smoking cigarettes, drinking co- and just in, and talking about the world issues, right? So I kind of designed the Hashi Cafe to be that, right? So, and you see, right, you see people kind of sitting in these three or four drinking their coffee and just like meeting. And so we make sure that throughout the space, we have these kind of different areas, right? That, that allow for people to sit together versus, right. You could just kind of put like long tables or big tables or like, we never, we try to avoid doing rounds, right. Cause those would be 10 people and it'd be kind of hard to talk to people. So again, it's, it's, it's how we design the space and the type of engagement. And then in the evening, right, we never did like a big party with loud music. We would call it an evening social, right? So we, we designed that experience. Like, yes, there'd be music off to the side, but there would be a bunch of games and, 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 and different places for people to connect, right? And, but connect over like playing game together. Yeah, first of all, uh, this whole experience sounds awesome. I, I should make sure to you know <laughs> to join you and your next event. And um, the the second part, you know, I really like what you said, which shows that you know you do not plan everything, including how will people interact. You know, you just give them a nice space where they can be relaxed, and then leave it up to them to actually decide how their community at that point will work together. Yeah. It's like, move the furniture around. Here's some whiteboards Do you, and here's some markers. You want to like, you know, draw visually. So it, it's, yeah, it's like, it's, it's providing the tools, right. That then like people will use to, you know, engage with each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you just mentioned before, you know, that an event is much more than, you know, a table with food, chairs and a projector. So what is something important that many event organizers miss, but, it's very important to the attendees. Um, I mean, we're all, you know, everyone organizes events and tries the best they can based on their budget. But again, like I mentioned, I go back to our two pillars, right, is education and connections. So we try really hard to have relevant content. We try not to sell like speaking spots. Um, We try hard to make it about the attendees and not, you know, giving sponsors too much and letting sponsors take over the conference. Also, like, for example, how we design, I never called it an expo hall, right? It was always the HashiCorp zone and HashiCorp area. So like, you know, 
the way we designed our our sponsor area was that it was never like people like people being bombarded by the sponsors. We actually didn't give sponsors like lead like lead devices, right? So they had to be very creative in how they co- collected leads because again, it, how do you c- genuinely connect with the attendees, right? Whether you're a sponsor or an employee or someone trying to hire. So I think sometimes event organizers just like here's a checkbox of things that a conference should have food, coffee, you know, but, but it's like, well, what type of coffee, right? And what type of food and how is that food set up? And then, you know, if you do sponsors, right? Well, it's like, what is the sponsor experience, right? Like, how do you want those attendees to engage with the sponsors, things like that? So I, I think there's just like a level deeper of like thought that goes into the different things that need to be at a conference that sometimes people don't do. Yeah, and I think there's two checklists here. Like one is the default of what an event should have and the other one should be what people coming to an event want or expect to see. Yeah, yeah, right? And if people are coming back year over year, right? It's like they, they're not coming for like paid content. You know, they're not like they're coming to meet with each other and they're coming to learn, right? And if, and if they're, you know, traveling from afar, And this is only like one of the two conferences they get to go to a year, right? So it's like spend some time really putting together a good experience for them. Yeah. And then the end of the day, you know, everyone wins. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right. They want to come back. They had a great time. Right. And and again, it's like, this is like, uh, it's, you know, it's a, they're experiencing your brand. Right. So it's like this conference that you put together, like this is a representation of, of like what your brand is, what your company stands for. And, and that's super important, right? So for us, it's, we try to create a really welcoming and warm environment, right? We try to be very helpful. We, we do the, the HashiCorp zone, right? So we have a, a Terraform area, right? Where we have Terraform experts there to, you know, our Terraform engineering team that's there answering questions, right? And, and so it's like, we want people to walk away with like, Oh, HashiCorp is this place that is just like they they have kindness and compassion and they're helpful and and I want to be a part of that and I want to interact with them and I want to use their products. Yeah, I'm sure everyone's listening is pretty nostalgic right now, you know, for uh, looking forward to an event. Yeah. <laughs> because all, you know, these experiencing a good event, we most of us at least uh, we've been there and uh, we know how much we enjoy it. We have then uh, 2020 Won't, I don't think we oh, need to, to tell many things about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah even the, the year uh, oh. is enough. So first question, uh, how did you pivot your strategy in 2020? Oh boy, I called it a hard pivot. <laughs> I, I gave yeah, a couple talks yes, last was. year. One was like how to become a thought leader in digital conferences in four weeks. And the other one was just like how to hard pivot. 2020 was just brutal. Uh, definitely in, in March of last year. Yeah, well, we all had our own experiences. I think for me, watching all of these programs that, you know, my team and I built over the years, just kind of like come to an abrupt halt was really like, I definitely became a bit depressed and, and was in a fog for a while. Because, you know, you, you spend a year planning something like we, we had three large scale conferences last year for our community. One was supposed to be in Sydney, the other was in Amsterdam. And the other one was going to be in California. Uh, we were expecting about 6,000 attendees across those three events. And we had already finished our, our European event. And we had finished our Sydney event, like the experience, the signage. We had announced, we had sponsors, we had speakers, we had venues, all of that stuff, right? And so to realize that like you have to unwind these programs, right? And so, so it's like we had to not only unwind, right? So negotiate with different vendors, you know, let vendors know that we weren't doing a program, which was brutal, right? I, I've worked with some vendors since 2015, 2016. So watching them, like their businesses crumble, like some of them filed for bankruptcy. So like, so that the weight of all of that, right? And then also what happens to my team, right? I, I have a team, it's myself and, and four full-time people under me. I'm like, okay, if we can't do in-person events, what, what happens to my team, right? Like why, why, why are, why is, HashiCorp paying us to be here. So it was like the weight of that. Um, so so I, I let myself sit with that for a while, but then I kind of like started to get excited about what we could build next, right? Because I, I love working at startups. I love building programs from scratch. Like that is like what excites me. Um, so we kind of took a step back and we're like, 
why, why do people attend? Why do developers attend conferences? And again, I go back to our two pillars, which have always been from 2015. It's kind of education, right? And it, it's, it's the high quality content and it's connections with each other. So based on those two pillars, we took a step back and, and that's how we designed our like digital conference program for the year, right? So we, and, and you think about an in-person conference, especially at the scale that we were going, right? You have a, you have a sponsor hall and you have four tracks or five tracks and you have a partner summit and you have an executive summit and, and you have 15 in-person full day train, right? So it's like, the in-person experience is so big and you're like, well, you can't translate that into a digital setting, right? It, it'd be impossible. And I, we've definitely seen people try. So I worked with my team. We're like, okay, well, let's just kind of give, let's just distill the experience down to those two things and then design it that way. And so what we ended up doing was uh, two digital conferences last year, right? That really focused on great content, really nice, like uh, we actually ended up building our own platform, right? And and people were able to chat, right? They were able to host lightning talks, right? So we we ended up doing digital conferences that were pared down versions of what you would do at in person, but designed for a digital experience. And they ended up being really successful. So we ended up having about twenty five thousand people that attended both of our you know our our two digital conferences we did last year. Um, really great engagement interactions. And again, like we saw that these conferences now became accessible to way more people, right? We had people from a hundred different countries attend. Cause again, it's like, it, it was free to attend. You didn't have to pay for it. And, and so I think what we learned last year is moving forward, our conference program will always have either a, a, some type of fully built out digital experience. Cause again, it's just like, we. We want this to, we want this to be accessible to a lot of people. Yeah, definitely, and uh, I I totally understand what you're saying. You know, having spent so many years uh, <laughs> affecting the physical event, and uh, all of a sudden you have to to stop abruptly and rethink the whole process of you know how to to deliver actually this the two pillars that you're talking about. So looking at it now, a year later, would you say that the Sift towards virtual events is also a good thing? Yes. So like I mentioned before, we just, there were so many benefits of a digital conference, right? It, it became accessible to way more people. It's also lower cost, right? You're, you're not paying to feed, you know, thousands of people for multiple days, building out stages, things like that, right? Our, our, we actually produced both of our events remotely. So we, we had like a command center, right? Where we had a production company that like did the whole broadcast. And then we had another company that like ran the platform, but it, it just, again, it became way more accessible and lower cost. So I think moving forward, we'll, we'll always have some type of digital component. That said, like we've talked about for the last, you know, 40 minutes in this podcast, people still want that, that connection and that human connection. So this this year we're gonna our programs fully fully digital, but uh, hopefully starting next year we could do some type of hybrid model, right? So it's, again, if you can't afford to travel, or if your company won't pay for it, or you just you know you have families at home, you can't you know take a couple days off. We'll always try to do some type of digital experience. You can still come and learn and connect with people, and then there'll be some type of in person experience as well. Yeah, hopefully next year. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, so, but it's just it's hybrid, right? It's it's and I think hybrid, that's a yeah. really it's going to be it's cool. I don't quite yet know how the hybrid will look and 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 how to do that. Um, but I'm that's I'm something I'm really excited to figure out next. So, uh, comparing physical events and virtual events, do you think that one is better for a specific occasion than the other? Is and vice versa, or? To make it more simple, do you think there there are occasions or uh, types of events that digital would work better than uh, a physical one? Yeah, I mean, if you think about, you know, your 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 toolkit of different like community programs and initiatives, in person events are one, and so are digital, right? But now that you could do a hybrid or you can do both of them, and you realize that there's benefit of both, I think you're just, I think all companies should adopt both models. But again, you know, we have like a field marketing team and they target more of our like enterprise customers. 
And so they do more like intimate, like dinners. And, and so I think that type of market like deserves more in person, right? Where you get to meet the CEO and, and, or you get to sit with our founders. So I think there's just like varying levels depending on the market and, and then who the kind of person is that you could do an in person versus um, digital. Yes, that's, uh, I agree a hundred percent there. So my next question would be on the, how do you see the future of events? So, but I guess you've already kind of touched upon this. Uh, it's hybrid. Yeah. So <laughs> it's hybrid, have any but speci- I also, yeah, it, it's so please, funny. Go ahead. It's definitely hybrid. I don't know if large scale conferences are going to come back. I don't, and I don't know if people, and I don't know, I'd love to hear your opinion, but for example, so in February of last year, I had like a four year uh, plan. I had like attendee growth projections, but you know, revenue sponsorship projections for the next four years, right? So I knew HashiConf in 2023 and 24 was going to be 8,000 and then 15,000 attendees, right? So I was about to book a a convention center for, for both of those years. And, and then thank good, I ended up not booking it, but I just don't see at least over the next, you know, couple of years with like the, the vaccine rollout being what it is, right. The different strains of COVID now, at least large scale events won't come back for the foreseeable future. That's one. And two, I don't know about you, but I actually don't like attending large scale conferences, right? Like we all go to AWS reInvent because we have to, but it's not an enjoyable experience, right? So at least for me, I don't know if HashiConf, at least for the next couple of years, will end up going back to like that that growth projection. But I, I, I could be wrong. We'll have to, first of all, uh, wait and see, I guess. Yeah. Uh, of course, you know, there's um, there are all kinds of pros and cons for bigger events and uh, smaller events. But big events, you know, can at some point be very chaotic. So if yeah, if we look at it from uh, your perspective, for example, there might be rich in content, but you might fail to make you know meaningful connections due to the vast size, you know, of people who you can connect to. Yeah, and you might have you know on the other side, medium medium size, not really meetups, but uh, you know more people than that, but still. W- that will be able to provide enough content for you to enjoy being there and learn, but at the same time, uh, allow space, you know, to meet people that you can really engage with and connect with and, uh, you know, return to your base, you know, feeling very excited for having attended this event. Such a great point. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's been great having you. Uh, we're uh, come to our uh, end. Unfortunately, uh, we could go on. Oh, and so on about sad. Events, I but... love this. <laughs> <laughs> and it's um, so nice to meet you. <laughs> Can we uh, before? It's great to meet you too and um, get a chance to pick your brain about events. If someone wants to hear more from you, how can they reach you? Yeah, I'm Yana Baruda on Twitter. And then I also just, you know, blog about various community building and experiential marketing things on medium uh also yana baruda okay great so and um to close in, on a positive note at least what's one good <laughs> thing that happened in 2020 i think for me i i think it changed me as i how i approach my life and and the ability to just kind of be still and quiet and slow down for a while has really just um just just changed in terms of just like how I feel and my happiness. I've had more time where I launched like a, a side project with some friends called uh, Epic Conf. I'm also about to publish a book on like how to do digital conferences. So I, it just, I've had more time, right? Because I'm not overly, overly subscribed. And, and so that, that's been my positive from 2020. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, uh, you know, taking for... Uh... You know, hoping that you know everyone is uh, safe and healthy you know throughout this whole uh, tedious process i think it has given us a lot of time you know to take a step back and uh, get a new perspective on things something good might come out from it yeah and just you, ha- you have to have faith right that we'll, we'll get through this and yeah yeah definitely <laughs> so uh Thank you very much, Jana, for joining us. And uh, thank you to our listeners for listening to Under the Hood of Developer Marketing, the podcast devoted to developer marketing and relations. You can listen to all episodes, find free resources and the latest news at deverlex.com. And you can also subscribe to our bite-sized bi-weekly digest or follow us on Twitter at slash data HQ. 
Jana, thank you very much. It's been great having you. Thank you so much. This was lovely.